has, has a guy that won the heavyweight championship twice. And he was so humble. He never bragged about anything, about any of his fights, about anything that he did in life. And he was, you know, just an, an encourager, just always saying positive things. I don't, I don't remember my dad ever saying to me, you know, in any fight, Trace, you, you gotta win this fight. He would always say, go out and do your best. That's it, just all I want you to do is to do your best. Whatever happens after that, happens. Now Patterson knows the title is there. And the first man ever to regain the heavyweight championship, the winner, Floyd Patterson. You know, he grew up in Brooklyn in a tough neighborhood. He often had to scrap his way for food and any kind of extra things that he wanted because he grew up in a family um, of 11 kids and they lived in one apartment, so they didn't have a lot of money. So he grew up in a rough surrounding and kind of, from an early age, got that fight in him. So that kind of carried him through to his career in boxing. Floyd was um, really insecure. He was one of a, a number. I don't know how many brothers he had in his family, but they were all boxers and bigger than him. And uh, by the time he got into boxing, he always had uh, an inferiority complex. In fact, one time he showed me a picture of, a fam of his family, and he was actually crossed out in the picture. And he said, see that X? That was me. I crossed out my own picture because I didn't think I belonged in that picture. That's how insecure he was. And he was ashamed of the way he looked, the clothing he wore. So I think that's what helped him stay very humble throughout his adult life and, and beyond, you know. He, that's one thing I always appreciated about him was, you know, everybody was always praising him and saying, oh, Floyd, it's so great to meet you. And, you know, like he was God or something, but he just still always stayed so humble and thought to himself, I'm no better than them. I'm a human being just like them. I don't understand why they like me so much. So he always just naturally had low self-esteem. One interesting story I remember is we were riding around his old neighborhood and it was just myself, my sister, and my father. And um, he stopped and started talking to people as he so frequently did. And there were a couple of gentlemen that appeared to be what I would consider homeless. And my father got talking to them. They were hungry, they asked for money. And he didn't want to give them money because he wasn't sure that they'd spend it the right way. But he said, if you're hungry, I have an idea, we'll all go to dinner. So my father, my sister, and I, and two homeless men went to dinner, and he recounted a lot of stories from his life, and it was actually quite neat. And I remember he called my mother from a payphone and said, I've, you know, I've taken a few friends to dinner, I'll be home a little bit late. And my sister and I were like, friends, we don't even know these people. But he made friends quickly. So it was kind of neat, never forgot where he came from. He learned at a young age to conquer his fears because um, actually when he was a young kid he got into some trouble and he was sent upstate to a private school for boys for troubled kids and that is really where he found his knack for boxing because he was picked on by another kid and he told me a story about how one day he just couldn't take it. This kid kept picking on him and finally he hit him and that's when everybody realized you know, he had such a good swing and that's how he pretty much conquered his fear there. And the boxing really brought him to a whole different level. Um, he obviously had an incredible amount of talent. He had a huge amateur boxing career, winning the New York Golden Gloves and going on to win an Olympic gold medal as a middleweight. He turned pro and he rose up the ranks very quickly as a light heavyweight. And it's hard to imagine this now, but Floyd Patterson was 182 pounds 
when he beat Archie Moore for the heavyweight championship of the world. And I said, why didn't you become a light heavyweight? Because he would have probably been the greatest light heavyweight that ever lived. Only one is the real Costa motto, and is the only one sworn to tell the truth. If you're playing along with us at home, as we trust you do each week, let's find out right now how right or wrong you may be. Now, I can't really think of a better way to uh, unmask the true identity of which one of these gentlemen is the real Costa motto than the uh, heavyweight champion himself. So, ladies and gentlemen, Floyd Patterson. Which one of these men is your real manager, Customato? <laughs> it seems to me I read in the paper, within the last two or three weeks, you had an addition to your family, didn't you? Yes, I did, a girl. A little girl? Yes. Now, does that make a boy and a girl? No, uh, two girls. Two girls? Yes. Well, the next time is the charm time, because I had two girls and then a boy, so the next one will be the future heavyweight champion of the world. Now, who do you fight next? Uh, Brian London, I believe. Uh, it'll be sometime in April. You want to reveal what round you're going to put him away in or not? Well, I don't generally do that. You don't do that. I know you don't. You're a very modest guy. I didn't realize that uh, the championship was going to be at stake in that match. Hmm? Is it? Obviously, it is. Yes, it is. In any fight that I have, unless it's merely an exhibition, championship will be at stake. Attaboy. Yeah, the peekaboo style was a little different than Mike Tyson's style. And, and Floyd would, would talk about Cus Diamato and what Cus was doing in Catskill. Um, you know, he would have the guys keep their hands up like this. He said, but I was fluid. I had my hands up, but I was loose. I wasn't a robot. He's teaching these guys to be robots. So he was a little critical of that, of that, of the, uh, Castiamata style, he had the hands up, but he was also using those hands to block and move. So it, it, was, a, it was a variation of that. You know, after the Sonny Liston fight where he was knocked out real early in the fight, he went out and bought a fake nose, mustache, and glasses, and pretty much stayed in hibernation for like six months. You know, he was... He just didn't want to face the uh, maybe the criticism or the feeling that maybe he had let people down because I remember him telling me about how he was at a fight and he was in the ring and he looked over and he saw John Wayne sitting there so he felt like he had to you know perform a certain way because this big cult hero of America was sitting right there watching his fight. He, everyone was very quick to point out that he got knocked down the most than any other boxer, but he was also never counted out on the canvas, so he felt if he held the record for being knocked down the most, he also held the record for getting back up on his feet the most. So that was, that was his response that I heard for 30 years, <laughs> which I guess is true. When Floyd Patterson, the trilogy with Ingemar Johansson was, uh, was the signature fights of his career, and the first loss, he felt so terrible about that. He felt not only did he lose the heavyweight championship, but he lost to a foreigner. And he felt he let the American people down. He wore disguises and he was ashamed. And that year was really a dark year that he trained because there was an automatic rematch clause back then. And so he trained incredibly hard to get ready for that, for that rematch. And the passion and dedication that he put into that training all stemmed from he felt he let his country down. And he had to win that second fight. And that second fight was just an incredible fight for him. Um, he just systematically tore apart Iggy Mario Hansen. And I just recently saw as one of the top 10 greatest knockouts in the history of boxing was the left hook he hit Iggy Mario Hansen with to, to knock him out and be the first heavyweight champion ever to regain the heavyweight championship. Now there's all kinds of titles and people are regaining titles all the time. But back then, nobody had ever done it. So he had two world records. He was the youngest heavyweight champion that ever lived, winning the title at 21. Mike Tyson beat that record um, uh, many years later. And he was the first heavyweight champion to regain the heavyweight championship when he knocked out Ingemar Johansson. And then, of course, there was a, a 
rematch because whenever you beat the champion, the, the champion got the rematch. And in that third fight, he got knocked down twice early in the fight. And it was, oh my God, it's happening again, like the first fight. And he switched his attack to the body and started breaking him down. And again, he knocked, he knocked out Ingemar twice in a row and, and, and got to keep his title. Today you look tremendously strong, in fact, stronger. Well, uh, I'm getting older, and I'm hitting that age now where you might call it a peak, when I'm supposed to be as strong as ever. Do you plan uh, or train for 15 rounds? I plan and train for 15 rounds, and in each and every fight I intend, I expect to go the distance. But like I always say, if the opportunity presents itself, whereas I can knock the opponent out, I'm going to take full advantage of it. He could have beaten Muhammad Ali. In fact, he was beating Muhammad Ali in their second fight. He was ahead on all three scorecards at the, in the eighth round, and he got stopped because his eye closed. But uh, he was winning on points. I can remember being at his last fight against Muhammad Ali for some unknown reason. My sister and I have an older sister, had ringside seats, and I remember watching the fight and hearing the noises and seeing like sweat fly off of foreheads and being really upset because my father was being hit and just being distraught over that. Um, he lost and I saw him a little bit later in a hotel. They always had like a party afterwards. And I saw him sitting in a chair much like I'm sitting in right now. It was backed up against a wall and his face was kind of swollen and bruised. And I saw him and I was too scared to go near him. And he called me over just like this and I went hesitantly and he just whispered in my ear, what's wrong? And I said, I don't, I don't like the way you look. And he said, what can I do to make it better? And I said, never do that again. And he said, okay. And he never fought again, but he never formally renounced, announced a retirement. And I can remember being with him and people would ask, Floyd, are you gonna fight again? Are you gonna fight again? And he would kind of jokingly turn to me and say, you'll have to get her permission first. <laughs> but that's my earliest memory of actually seeing him separate as a separate entity, I, I don't know how else to explain that. He immediately, I mean, he had to stay connected to the boxing world because that was in his heart. So he opened up the gym in New Paltz and trained everyone under the sun. And that was his connection. So he was still in the world, but yet not in the world himself. Um, I was 11 years old and myself and my younger brother, you know, we wanted to um, start boxing. We found out that there was a boxing club in New Paltz, and uh, we were pretty overwhelmed, you know, seeing, you know, the Floyd, Floyd Patterson, two-time heavyweight champion, you know, so of course we both were very quiet because we were shy anyway, so he came, actually came over to us, had to come over to us and ask us what, you know, what we wanted to do, and then we proceeded to tell him we wanted to, you know, try to, you know, box. I was, I had, I had a lot more hair back then. I was uh, 16. I always heard about his team, and he had a great, a great stable of amateur fighters. Um, and I just wanted to go up there, and uh, took me in with open arms, man. I mean, it was probably one. Of, it was. I still remember being scared driving up that long driveway and saying, "What am I doing?" It, the gym was to the right of the house, the, where he resided. So. And uh, he's trained there and uh, for some championship fights. He just had one of the best fields in the world. I just made the basketball team in eighth grade, and my friend and I, Ricky Moss, went up to Floyd's. We had heard he had a boxing club. I always wanted to box. I always loved boxing, but I didn't have the courage. I thought I was too young. So I walked up that long driveway, and uh, he was working in the backyard. And I, I said, you know, I'd like to learn how to box, but I, I, I was thinking I might be too young. He's never too young, son. You're 13 years old, 103 pounds. Um, I said, can I, can I see the gym? So he brought me up to the gym, and I saw the heavy bags, and I smelled the, the atmosphere. It just I, something clicked inside of me. I was like, "Hold, oh, this is this is where I want to be." And I asked him if I could hit the heavy bag. I didn't know what I was doing, but he let me punch the bag. And he said, "Come back at five o'clock. We'll get started." And I quit the basketball team, and I dedicated the next ten years of my life to to boxing. My mom, she um decided that she wanted to move back down south. I believe I was 14 or 15 years old at the time. And I, I had grown, you know, to um, love boxing, love everything about it. You know, the, the, the guys in the gym, you know, they, bec they became like big brothers to me and, and as well as he was a father figure to me. And I, I wanted to, you know, stay there because, and pursue this and, and see how far I could go.
It was like a thing every night at 5.30. There was always boxing at 5.30. So my grandparents would come out of the house. I would come out. My sister would come out. My mother would come out. And we would all go over and watch the sparring from 5.30 to 6.30. He would, he would get in there and he'd box every single fighter that was in the gym to help them, you know, get to where they needed to be. Very early on, he encouraged me. He said, you know, you have a special talent. You could, you could do something in this sport. But I never would have been in the Olympic trials. I was number one in the country in 1981 as an amateur. It was his belief in me that made that happen. He just had more feelings for people, and he didn't want anybody to get hurt because he knew how brutal this sport is. He stopped fights on me, man. I didn't even throw a punch. <laughs> Excuse me. I was like, what the fuck? He goes, Brian, that guy lied to me. He said he only had 20 fights. He's had over 125 fights. That's what he did, because he, he protected his, his, his fighters. You know, he was very technically sound. He, he gave a great corner guy. He would see things in corners. You know, he, he, he never overwhelmed you. He'd come down, he was very calm. Come back after the first round, you sit down. You didn't say anything for the first few seconds. Let us catch our breath. Okay, you okay? How you feel? Gained information. He was brilliant. All right, two things. One. This guy is wide open for a left hook. I want you to double the jab and, and come off with a left hook. And offensively, the only thing he's got is a right hand. Watch for that right hand. If he doesn't hit you with the right hand, you don't have to worry about anything else. You got that? The left hook on offense, right hand on defense. Take a deep breath. All right, boom. So he's a master at giving feedback. He was he kept it very clear, very simple. And I've had other people work my corners. I was on the United States boxing team fighting in Germany and the best coaches, amateur boxing coaches in the country were supposedly uh, these great coaches. They, they weren't as good as him. They would tell you five different things and they would contradict themselves and they were all excited in the corner. He, calm, this is what you do, execute. He had a personality that he really wanted to see a young man make it. And I think that, you know, him seeing me come up as a, as a kid from 11 years old to a man to getting ready to fight for, for the championship of the world. And he knew how much it meant to me. So it meant that much even more to him, you know, and that's just why he's, he's so special. I mean, he did wonders in my life. You know, if, if it wasn't for him, I don't know where I would be today. You know, and he helped straighten me out and, 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 hit, and put me in the right direction. He always had I don't know if it was a Bible, but it was always a little book, you know, and it had a cross on it. It had probably a lot of excerpts from the Bible and stuff. He, uh, he cherished his relationship with God very greatly, and you could see that was more evident towards the end of his life when he was starting to really lose it mentally. He would start talking about how much he loved God and his relationship with God and just how he hoped that he had helped, you know, as many people as God wanted him to. So I know he took his relationship with God and his overall um, Christianity, he was Catholic, but Christianity very seriously. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in the fall of 1998. I think it was hardest on those close to him because we saw the changes occurring. He never actually, you don't remember that you don't remember. So he didn't know, but it was tough to watch. It was tough because I really didn't know what was going through his head, like how aware he was of you know what day it is what's going on who's here but um he still had the same personality he was still a very sweet guy and treated everybody with kindness and respect and st he still loved the physical activity because even though he didn't go up to the gym and work out like hitting the heavy bag and stuff we have a huge property it's like 15 acres he would still go outside every day during the summer and uh, mow the lawn you know pull all the weeds forget a weed whacker he would pull all the weeds he, he wanted as much labor as he could and he'd be out there literally from noon to sunset, even when he had full-blown Alzheimer's. If it wasn't for boxing, like I've said, he didn't know where he would be today, you know? So boxing also was a, a, a very, very special thing to him. You know, and of course there's risk, but you gotta be willing to take the risk. And, and I think that he was very satisfied and, and everything that he did while he was here on Earth. I really truly believe that. And I wrote Floyd a letter, um, maybe three years before he passed, and 
a father had come to me and said that his son was a really shy kid and that he had just won the Empire State Games. He had about 40 amateur fights and he had sort of blossomed because of boxing. And the father told me how big an impact boxing had had on him and thanked me. And I wrote to Floyd and I said, this is something that's going on that you have no idea about. But a father just thanked me for making a difference in his son's life. And uh, that's coming directly from you. That it's your lineage. That you have had a dramatic effect on this kid's life through me. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And I never, I, I hadn't talked to him. I went to visit him in the hospital. And by that time, he was very ill. But his wife, Janet, told me that that letter meant an awful lot to him. He, yeah, I don't know if you, he was just, you know, greatness, you know. And, 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 and one package. I mean, he, he was very special. You know, there's, there's none like him. No, nowhere. You know, um, I've been here on Earth almost 50 years, and, and I haven't seen any, anyone, you know, not a human that, that, that measures up to him.